Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. This week, we are heading up to New England with today's guest, Mandy. Hi. Hey, nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're excited to talk to you about your growing, your quickly growing scene. Because you've been playing since October, and it sounds like your tournaments have been getting much, much bigger. Yeah, Jeez. they have been. Um, our regular community has been steadily growing. Um, we're up to about, averaging about 16 players at our monthly tournaments. So pretty good, um, solid crowd. Yeah, and I think when we first started talking to you to set up this podcast, you were playing Death Guard, and now you're playing Kasserkin. Yes, yeah. I've, I've been dabbling in a, a few different teams, but... Yeah, I've been like a Kasserkin so far. Yeah, yeah, it'll be fun for us to chat about a little bit about your local scene, your growing scene, and some of these more powerful teams. You know, upgrading from a bespoke team to or upgrading from a compendium team to a bespoke team is generally a big thing for a lot of players. So we can talk about how that happened. Sure. But how's your how's uh real life been going for everybody? Yeah, it's been going good. Uh, the store's been pretty busy. Recently, we're um, gearing up for PAX Unplugged in Philadelphia at the end of November. Um, but outside of work, lately it seems like I just can't put my PS5 controller down because I'm loving Baldur's Gate 3. Oh, yeah. Are you excited for the new Spider-Man game? You know, I am. Um, the Miles Morales one was really, really good. Yeah, definitely a spot where, as a PC player, I'm kind of jealous of the uh, Spider-Man fans right now. <laughs> Spider-Man 2 looks really good. Yeah, I... I Unfortunately, I'm just uh, looking for the job right now. How about you, Jason? What are you up to? Well, um, I actually uh, put Baldur's Gate in my buy now <laughs> box and then didn't buy it yet. Um, but I have been thinking about that. The light at the end of the tunnel for work is getting pretty close for me. So I'm going to have a little more time then. But um, one thing that I did do that was not work related was join that CPTS tournament, um, which actually Kirill told us about last week uh two weeks ago mm -hmm. so i just joined that and uh getting back into playing kill team on tts so that should be playing? fun there are a couple rounds that are overlap with pretty crazy work schedules so i'm just playing intercession this is just to get your uh, just get practice in basically yep just kind of like welcome back to tts and and like welcome back to playing kill team besides just the casual monday nights and tiptoeing back into it well i'm nice. excited to figure out uh what kind of crazy strategy you're gonna come up with intercessors which In which tactics are you using jason um so i'm looking at accurate and mobile and accurate is well can you can you uh re accurate remind readers what accurate is because i don't even remember yeah because no one no one chooses this um it's the one where if you get a critical hit it gives you no cover for that shot and wow. with the Ooh. with the bolt rifles that have the scopes and otherwise like auto bolt rifles with like reroll ones and doctrine rerolls, you're going to be throwing enough dice to be getting critical hits most of the time. And from playing in cursors a bunch, I realized how strong no cover was and put that with P1 and it's extra strong. So I'm feeling decent about it. Um, and the other thing that is cool about that is the the adaptive tactics. You can switch it to the one that makes you three, three mortal wounds one. And then um, against people that have damage reduction, like uh, Breachers. I don't think there's any Breachers in that <clears throat> circuit right now, but um, there is some Chaos Cult. Then you're just 3-3 three, three Mortal Wounds 1, and then their damage reduction is meaningless, and then you just laugh it off as you slay everyone. You're right, all right. Mobile is uh, doing something doing something with fallback, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so you fall back for one APL, and then um, that was my first ever take on intercession, and it like was really fun and went really well. And like a lot of people will try to like tone down the the shooting menace that is intercession by tagging them, but if you can just fall back and still double shoot, it's kind of a nightmare. All right, well, you know, I will. I'm sure Mandy's looking forward to hearing about that as well. Sounds really solid. Yeah, yeah, but it's fun. We're here to talk about New England. That's true. Yeah, yeah, and I'm kind of curious because many are on the newer side, so I figured that we could use this podcast to talk about maybe some of the pitfalls that you bumped into as a newer player, either starting as a new TO or actually just like picking up teams and getting like getting into the game. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, the hardest, the one that jumps out as being the most difficult would be like line of sight and obscuring. Um, mm -hmm. the rules for line of sight are like so dense and they're also like really different from big hammer or 40k. Um, 
So I'm hopeful that like in the next edition, they'll like consolidate that down more and make it a little bit more simpler and easier for newer players. They could at least give better examples for new players. Because yeah. I think right now the book, I think if you read the FAQs, there's kind of enough explanations where it makes sense. But in the actual core book, it's very, very hard to actually tell that it's actually like aura bubbles that ignore terrain or like let you use terrain to your advantage, which is not obvious. Right. I agree. Yeah. I It definitely took me some time to get that down. And sometimes I still forget. <laughs> yeah. Some, I mean, it's easy, it's easy enough to forget. Or you could just be like Jason and use a team that you can just ignore one of the entire steps for the shooting chart. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was like my favorite thing about Incursors is the entire team ignores obscuring. <laughs> and that's just like <laughs> ridiculous. Um, mm-hmm. I do, because of that, I've come to appreciate obscuring just because it makes ignoring it so strong. <laughs> but yeah, those rules like could definitely wanna... be toned down. Yeah, I think they definitely need some clearing up. I think, you know, last week, Kirill, he mentioned, or a couple weeks ago, Kirill mentioned that the rules are not meant for humans, and they really are not the easiest. The easiest way I've tried to break it down for players is that there's a two-inch bubble around every model's base, where if there's a piece of heavy terrain outside of it, and it's the closest piece to your uh, base, uh, you're getting obscured, obscuring, basically. Unless your opponent's opposing model is within an inch of that wherever that bubble is. That's like the easiest way for me to do it. Yeah. But even even with that, it's hard to imagine those bubbles on at all times, unless you're playing on TTS and you have the bubbles turned on for everyone. <laughs> yeah, and even just like knowing how it works really well and trying to listen to you or anyone else try to explain it, it's always like, oh yeah, that is the, that is the clunkiest part to, to, un- to explain and to understand. But like once you understand mm-hmm. it, it's, it does seem really, really just like easy. But... Yeah, as a, as an obstacle for beginners, it's definitely a big one. Yeah, I think yeah. the early editions of Kill Team, or like earlier when the edition had come out, people would use the Arquebus in extremely weird ways, saying that like, you know, I'm getting obscurity from these angles, but it's actually just a two-inch bubble around the base, and that's what you're imagining, and that helps a lot, I think. But even with that, it's still not the easiest to explain. So for newer players, I tend to just ignore it and then skip it and bring it back later on. I don't know if you've done anything similar, because it sounds like, Mandy, you're probably also showing people how to play the game right now. Um, From time to time, I think um, more often than not, like with my new work schedule, I haven't really been present on casual nights, but I have been definitely inviting people to come um, because our regular players on our casual nights are just so welcoming. Um, they're very experienced and very patient and always willing to let people borrow their teams and such. So i um, been able to kind of lean on them. Yeah. <clears throat> Being welcoming is super useful for getting new players into the scene, yeah? Absolutely. I think um, a lot of my regular players are just thrilled at the idea of like new people to play against. So like inviting people in is is part of that you know yeah Uh, so your tournament started off with three people upwards in april and now you're looking at maybe 16 people uh by the time this podcast comes out your most recent tournament will have passed but maybe for the november one in case anyone's in the new england area they can take a visit yeah we would love that um our November tournament is going to be Saturday the 18th this year. Okay. Nice. Um, so generally middle have... of the month? Yeah, yeah. Um, it really just depends. Um, at the beginning of the year, they were kind of like more towards the end. But as schedules come, you know, the holidays are coming and those are later in the months. Um, tried to like push it towards the middle. Okay. And when you were the newer player learning how to play the game, what got you to get uh, get into the game a little bit more than you would have expected? Um, I think for me, I was already coming from like, in, I had an interest in these games, um, like tabletop war games in general, um, but I had never really played them before. And then when I started working at my store... Um, our casual guys kind of like started approaching me, talking to me about it. 
Um, and I was like, yeah, maybe you guys could teach me. And they were like, sit down, have have some fun. And my boss was like, yeah, you know what? Just sit down and play a game, you know, get into it. I was like, okay. So, you know, I started playing with them on Thursday nights and eventually they started asking me for um, some organized play. And which teams were you playing back then? Like, did you stick to Space Marine teams or did they get you into the deep end by playing like Vet Guard or something? Um, they honestly opened up their box and had like <laughs> at least 10 teams between them. They were like, what are you interested in? What looks cool? Just pick something. Um, so it was pretty cool. And they all, they had like rosters already pre-built for me to borrow and, and stuff like that. I think the first time I played... I almost want to say I went right to Rubric Marines, like Thousand Suns. So between them and Chaos and Death Guard, those are your early like Chaos has always been there at the beginning, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um. So you found that running tournaments helped build up your scene, or was there a lot of casual gaming nights that you had to run up before switching over to running tournaments a little bit more regularly? Because I'm sure there's a handful of people who are listening who are trying to build up their own scenes and wondering if you had any any advice in those situations. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, it's always good to have, like, as long as you have, like, a solid, small group of people that are um, very dedicated to coming to your casual nights. Um, but then you start running the ca- the actual tournaments. Um, the whole thing with like building this community has just been honestly consistency. Um, when we first started having the tournaments, like I said, it was literally our three regular players who came to the first one. And mm-hmm. you can't give up after running like one, two, or even three tournaments. You have to keep scheduling them. And we used to be like, we thought we were going to start with a semi-monthly, but then we started hosting monthly and it just kept growing and growing and growing. Yeah. So the consistency is a huge thing I've heard across the board. So for anyone interested in building up their uh, your own communities, there's going to be some slow days. Yeah, that's for sure. Yep, definitely a theme there. Uh, and just like power through the slow days and, and all of a sudden you'll you'll have something. Um, yeah, so it's it's great to to see that play out. Build it, and they yeah. shall come. They say true. Yeah, it sometimes in the building it can be a little can be a little barren. I guess it helps that you're working at the shop. It sounds like compared to a more casual person who's setting up shop at a shop. Yeah, do you think so, that's helped on your part? I think so. Yeah. Um, I mean, but it it doesn't have to be, you know, if you're somebody who's coming to the store weekly on kill team nights, you know, you could definitely build your own community. Um, For for me, though, working at the store and seeing people a lot more and being able to invite people from other communities to come and try kill team has been like great. Um, And now that I've uh, become the store manager, it's even even more so. So have you found a lot of uh, 10th edition players or other formats are coming over to Kill Team or are Kill Team players their own thing? Like where, if people were trying to find new players, which pool of players should they be pulling from, from your experience running a shop? Yeah, so it's really interesting. It's kind of both of the of what you just said. There's, there's some of both. Um, I think that running our Kill Team tournaments on Saturdays has been very beneficial because we have... Saturdays are kind of like a a day for kind of everyone. I mean, there's a lot of casual commander magic players, stuff like that, but also some casual 40k players. And so um, in past tournaments, they've been kind of like peeking across the room, seeing what's going on over there and coming over to kind of watch and stuff like that. And eventually they're starting to ask like, hey, I'm kind of kind of interested. Maybe could you teach me how to play? Like, let's try something, you know? I was going to say, um, I think that ties in nicely with hometown heroes. Um, are there any like big, outstanding people that have that are like deserve a shout out for all the the work that they've been doing to also help grow the community? Absolutely, um, definitely. Big shout out to Chris Borzamato from Norton. Um, he was he's definitely my store's community's go-to guy he's very knowledgeable easy to talk to 
and just wants nothing more than for new folks to try the game out. Um, he's the one that actually asked me to start holding the organized play. And so we wouldn't have monthly tournaments without Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for uh, helping us set up these tournaments and getting Mandy onto this podcast. Yes. Big thanks, Chris. Anyone else? Or has it mostly been, uh, you know, it's a lot of on the ground work between you and your most committed players. Or has there any, been anyone new or newer players that have gotten better over the last couple of months that you'd like to shout out? Um, I honestly, I'm just glad that we have every single person in our community. Um, every single one of my players is just like extremely kind. We don't, we're very lucky. We don't have any like, you know, super sweaty players, they would call them. Um, so just very blessed, very honored to be a part of what we have. There's nothing wrong with sweaty players from time to time, but I, yeah, definitely sometimes <laughs> people bring the intensity level up too much, I think, where it's not wanted. For sure. For sure. Have you had to de-escalate any, you have, it sounds like you haven't had to de-escalate any of those moments. So no, I, I honestly haven't. Um, anytime that there's been some sort of a rules question that comes up uh, in our scene, it's never been met with any sort of conflict at all. Instead, it's more addressed from a teachable moment for both parties and just mutual respect and just figuring it out together. It's positive it's productive it's never been uh there's never been a scene where i've had to de-escalate anything because we've just seeded this community with with respect and it's just it's grown from that and it's really beautiful i think it's good sounds good anyways how is there like a question that's come up a lot for you and these tournaments since it sounds like you're on the newer end of the tournament scenes like has there been a question that you've come and run into or things that you're curious about rules wise um, not in particular, no. Nice. No, I mean, it sounds like, you know, we can get into the Operative Showdown, huh? Sure. Operative Showdown! And, you know, I'm curious to hear some of your opinions about Casterkin, because it sounds like you've been having fun playing a bespoke team after upgrading from Compendium. So generally in Operative Showdown, we like to talk about the pros and cons of specific things, just so we can talk about things within uh, the army, basically. So looking at the Kasserkin, do you have any big pros and cons for the gun types? Generally looking probably at the Hotshot Volley and the Flamer, because I think in general, you're almost always taking the Plasma and the Grenade Launcher at least. But maybe you don't always take the Melta. I'm just curious what your, um, some of your pros and cons for the gun types. Yeah, so I think like when you're talking about like the Flamer, um, you're looking at like obviously your short range, but low damage, but you are hitting on twos. So you do have the advantage that you can spend your elite points on other things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always like a viable reason to take a flavor. Um, in terms of like hotshot volley, you've got fusillade, which is worse blast and P1, which isn't guaranteed. So it's kind of like combining both the grenade options into one, but mm -hmm. it is going to be like less consistent. But you're, are you generally taking the Hotshot Volley? Because I think when I look at the Cash Grand Gunner options, I'm always taking the Plasma and I'm always taking the Grenade Launcher because those two do a lot of work, especially with Elite Points. And then I'm looking out at the rest of the gun spread and trying to figure out which of those Gunner options I want between the Melta and the Flamer and then the Hotshot Volley, right? Yeah, I think my personal favorite is the Melta Gun. It's just got great damage. The AP2, yes, it's got shorter range. That's the downside, but I think you really can't beat that great damage. And are you often like trying to fish for a crit and then pushing it up? Or are you like, I? one of the fun things about the elite points are with a melted gun, you can run up, fire the melted, and even if you miss all four, you can always get at least one crit. And that one crit will do at least four damage, right? Yeah. Which, which guns do you find that you're babying the most with elite points? Like, are you spending it on the, your high-profile guns, your Plasma and your Melta, or are you trying to make sure that across the board you're generally using your elite points uh, everywhere? I think I'm definitely favoring the heavy hitters, um, just really ensuring that I can take out, like, prime targets. Yeah, I think, you know, there was a player who just played at Kill Scream a couple weekends ago in Oregon who got second place with Kasserkin, and I think he mimics some of the same things where when you fire your big guns, the good thing about elite points is you can guarantee something will happen, even if it is just 
a one hit with AP2, that one hit is generally still pretty important, especially against things like elites or Kasukun are at their best. Right. Yeah. And there's like, there's a couple of weapons that hit on like threes and twos and they stack well with like, I th- consider those to be my like top tier heavy hitters. So the leader's plasma pistol um, hitting mm-hmm. on threes with elite points um, is going to give you some like really good results. Um, kind of similar with the, the crack grenade. Um, also hits on threes and um, it's just kind of like you you get overall more amazing consistency with those elite points where like hitting on fours you hit two and then you you need to use elite points to get a third hit and then with hitting on threes you pretty often hit three and you use your elite points to get all four and that's just like a big spike in damage um, and kind of yeah. similar with the with the sniper hitting on twos like there's there's a lot of those little tools in there yeah yeah that's Casker definitely play pretty fun. Are you using the uh, the warriors? Or I don't know if they're called warriors for the the troopers. Are, are you using the troopers as your grenade caddies, or are you using other models to hold your frag and crack grenades? Or are you always taking frag and crack grenades? Um, I'm always taking frag and crack grenades. Are you generally putting them on Casker troopers so that you can get the free elite points? Yes, for sure. <laughs> Free elite points yeah. is like is great. Yeah, the pool of points that you have to pull from is a lot nowadays, and especially when you're moving to a hitting on threes weapon, generally helps a lot. Do you have any opinions on the Vox Trooper or the Recon Trooper? Like, which ones are you getting more play out of? I think the Vox Trooper, for everyone that doesn't know, is the one that gives like the no cover bonus, and then the Recon Trooper is the one that gives you the extra the extra recon option yeah so i think like when you're looking at like recon versus fox i think recon you have the extra recon dash just for bringing him up in the beginning can be really helpful for setting you up but Mm -hmm. the aspects can help make the team like help the team take out a really key enemy that needs to get taken care of um but then with the Vox, you have the Vox and he's just like a total all-star. He just hides in the back somewhere and throws one or two extra APL wherever you need it the most. Yeah, he's not often moving around that much, right? Right, yeah. So I think um, between them both, I think my vote would have to be for the Vox. Yeah, being able to just shove all the APL around is just too important. But you're always taking, I assume you're always taking the Recon Trooper as well. Or is there, are there games when you're not taking it for an extra Trooper for the free Elite points? Yeah, I definitely, I have um, omitted a Recon before. Um, and I think, like, it's really just situational. Yeah, and what situations are you dropping Recon Troopers? Just so listeners can, you know, try it out. Um, Honestly, I think I just try things out (laughs) um i know that's like not very tactical but like i just on different days i just take different troopers and i just uh i just try new lists just for fun i think that's that's an important part while players are like learning their teams to try out all the different combinations so i think it's actually a good thing even if it's not maybe the you're like locked and loaded but it, it i think it's important to experiment still have you run into any issues with uh, melee, like just being able to do melee, or things post buff have been good enough for you to manage your melee threats? Yeah, I mean, obviously, Kasserkin, like, melee is not their strong point, but mm-hmm. um, I built my sergeant to have the power sword because I thought mm-hmm. it was super cool. Um, yeah, you just you have gun butts and that's it. So it's. You know, You've got the gun butts. You've also got the combat blade or the scion blade that you can take. Y- yeah, I yeah. So if you, I've found that if you do have combat blades equipped and you use the 4K deploy, that it's good, but it also like eats EP and CP. So it's, it can be tough. Yeah. An important reminder just for listeners is the combat blade is three attacks on fours, three, four damage. And then if you have four Cadia going, it goes to four, five damage, which means that with an elite point, you can almost always get at least five damage if you want to burn a CP and an equipment point. And I guess, you know, for the sergeant, you end up being able to do up to seven damage on a melee 
melee attack, right? With Forcadia? I, so Forcadia, I don't think would stack. Oh, no, but it's only for gun sword. butts. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but yeah, like yeah. Still, it only works with a combat blade. With a lethal five, just pushing up to a crit is like extra efficient to get there. Um, and just like putting five or six damage in a single hit and like as reliably as you can with elite points is honestly so much more powerful than it sounds. Like it's it's strong. <clears throat> So because you have the power sword in your sergeant, you can't take the plasma pistol. So you have the hotshot last pistol. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Are you planning to uh, build another Cassican sergeant at some point just to have both options? Um, I would say I have plans to do it right now, but that could be a good option in the future. I guess I hadn't really considered it. I just uh, I kind of bounce around from team to team, try new things, build new things. So. What are you looking at uh, after Cassican? Um, I recently played my first game with the Harlequin troop, um, mm-hmm. and they're pretty cool. I really like them. There's uh, like no skill overlap between the two teams, though. No, totally. No, that's they're, a big change. They're very yeah. different. Yeah, Void Dancers are definitely one of those teams where you just take, you have a whole different rulebook that you get to play compared to everyone else. So maybe we'll go to niche tactics then, yeah? Sure. Niche tactics. Yeah, so today's niche tactics, we are taking it back to the compendium and chatting about Death Guard and some of the combos there, cool synergies, uh, whether or not Pox Walkers should ever be taken. (laughs) Um, If you're asking my personal opinion, I would say no, but I guess I'm a little biased because I don't don't run them. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's sad because I think at the beginning of the edition, when the game first came out i always told people to try everything but i think after watching people try pox walkers for a couple months i don't actually think pox walkers are ever actually good enough they're just too slow yeah the slowness plus the like the terrible action economy it it costs two actions to do anything is really just a rough combo um, like in some of the older missions, it was a little bit easier but like in the critical ops mission pack the pox walkers can't get a dang thing done yeah, they just take so long to move. So I've definitely come down on my opinion on Pox Walkers over time. Do you have any operatives on the Death Guard roster that you really love, Mandy? Um, I think, personally, I, I really love my captain. He's got this giant power fist that has Brutal on it. I just, I think he's so cool. All right, all right. So the, the big boy, the big stinky boy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Did you find running into the four movement uh, movement problem a big issue when you were trying to learn how to play the game? Yeah, I mean, yeah, four inch movement is very slow. Um, mm-hmm. But so I, you're, I assume you were often taking the plague bell, using it early on, so that you could run away from the plague bell, basically. Ab- absolutely. Yep. I always, my whole thing is, I always put. Um, my guy equipped with the plague bell like i try to position him in kind of a central location when the battle starts so that uh the first turn i can ring the bell and then the guys can can scatter Mm -hmm. and when was the last time you played them so i'm just wondering how much of the crit ops you've actually played with them because i haven't seen anyone play death guard in a while locally so i'm curious how it's been going yeah, I think the last time I took them to a tournament was back in July. Okay. Oh, so you're playing in the tournaments that you're running? Not typically, no. That was, uh, I played in one tournament that I ran. <laughs> oh, I see. How they do in that outing? Which operatives uh, did the most work? Was it a combination of the fighters or was it your champion just because he's the coolest? So you made sure that he got the gun to the coolest situations? I think they all they all did their job. I mean, I really like um, I really like to run a melee heavy team. I think it's fun. Um, also, disgustingly resilient. I mean, who doesn't who doesn't want to like roll a bunch of dice every turn, you know, and just shrug mm-hmm. a bunch of wounds? It's a uh, it's a nice feeling. So that's definitely like my favorite part of playing Death Guard. Which fighters were, are you often taking? You know, we've got, there's just so many options on the Death Guard side. So I'm wondering which of these plethora of options you're taking the most often. Um, I have, hold on, let me pull up my roster here. Yeah, because I think for listeners who don't know, you know, the Death Guard have one of the widest, I think, initial rosters for melee fighters in the compendium. So they've got uh, the Plague Marine fighter. You can take 
you could take a bubotic axe, and there's a lot of five attack options here. So five attacks on threes, four, six, rending. Flay of Cor Corruption, which is five attacks on threes, four, five, reap two. The Great Plague Cleaver, five attacks on fours, five, seven, rending. And then the Mace of Contagion, five attacks on threes, four, five, stun. And then you have four attacks on threes, three, five, relentless with the Plague Knives. So you basically got all of the special rules for melee weapons in the game on this one profile that you can take. I think two of and if you take the if you take an all death guard team yeah if you do yeah. all plague marines yeah if you take all plague marines you can take two fighters if I remember correctly and listeners if you know that's wrong you can come in and yell at us in the discord oh, yeah. come yell at us come yell at me we invite you on my team i have my champion i've got a fighter who's equipped with the bubonic axe and the mace of contagion I also have a Plague Marine Heavy Gunner that has the Plague Spewer because I just think it, when I was modeling it, it was like, this is really funny. It kind of looks like a leaf blower. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I ran him. Um, I also have an Icon Bearer uh, for the bells. I have the bells equipped to him. Mm -hmm. And I've got my two warriors. All right. All right. So you've got a Bubotic Axe. Or no, the... Yeah. The yeah, that's axe. correct. Yep. And a cleaver? He's got the axe and the mace on the one model. Um, it's uh, oh, okay. Yes, he's got rending and stun. Yeah, and you can like choose based on on whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. I've got options, which is important. So many options. Yeah. So you've you've got a bunch of five attacks on threes, four or five, or four plus models with rending or stun, and then looking at your heavy gunner, maybe not the most competitive option because the plague spear is six attacks on twos, two three range six torrent two, and I assume it's got to be really really hard to actually get in range. Yeah, I think um, although like where my team is so melee heavy, um, mm -hmm. the range hasn't been like too much of a tr a problem for me. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm already like trying to keep in close quarters with most of my other units, so I see. Yeah, I I did. I actually brought Death Guard to like a, a goofy little narrative tournament somewhat recently, and I brought the Plague Spewer too, um, just because with six dice and like um, I brought him out for the Into the Dark, so it was six dice hitting on twos, lethal five, two, three, and like you just get like a couple little, you get like two crits and and three hits, and then someone like whiffs on their dice and only saves like one then all of a sudden they've taken like 10 damage Obviously, yeah but, uh, like it's just like um it actually in the game i brought it against custodians i had him run out as my last activation and shoot a shield custodian and it did like 10 damage and then the next turn i got initiative and i shot the custodian again and it and killed him it's pretty good nice. yeah i could see that working I specifically on In the Dark, I do think that maybe the Plague Spear, if you were a Death Guard diehard, then it might have reason to be on your roster at least. But yeah. I mean, so you don't have any of the gunner options, Andy. That's a uh, that's probably the more interesting one. Yeah, no, I just have the heavy gunner. Okay, all right, dang, that's really really out there on the <laughs> for the meta picks because I'd be you know the pl I would expect that if you did want to play them competitively, you probably would want a plasma gunner at some point. Just because uh, the long-range threat is so powerful. Yeah, I have... My Plague Marine Champion does have a plasma pistol, but it, like you said, it's still got the range. But mm -hmm. being able to have like the AP on that is really good. Yeah. It's always great. We can never get away from the AP. Have you ever gotten to use some of the more unique boys on the Death Guard to your advantage? I know the one that everyone was looking at when the team first came out was Dig In, so you could get for defense so it sounds like with the plague spear maybe not but people were always talking about getting a plasma gunner up onto advantage digging in so that even on an ap2 gun you were still rolling two dice on threes and then just being super obnoxious to everyone else yeah i really like um i really like to use effluent demise <laughs> that one's <laughs> fun too just like blowing up when you die with the melee heavy <laughs> yeah, for... that makes a lot of sense if players don't know, it's um, when an Astarte dies, you can inflict D3 mortal wounds on each enemy operative visible to and within two inches of that operative. So it's like turning your guy into a mini grenade. Yeah, going out with a bang. It's also, you also have revolting durability, which is different from some of the transhuman physiology effects that come in later on in the bespoke teams. So you can actually take a normal hit or you take a critical and treat it as a normal hit when you get hit by it, which is pretty interesting. 
Or it's actually even better than that. You can, instead of them retaining like a normal hit, a critical hit, you can change it to a normal hit. Because the ploy for revolting durability is use this attack ploy and either resolve successful hits or resolve successful states. Of a combat or shooting attack made against a friendly Astartes operative, you can change one of your opponent's critical hits into a normal hit. So that might actually stop your opponent from retaining stuff. I don't know if that was ever FAQ'd anywhere, but yeah, it's so certainly... Like a critical hit from a melta gun and you make those four mortal wounds go away? Yeah, I don't know if that's actually how I rule that in a tournament, but it's not like this team can't use the help. So it's an interesting one because it is specifically in the successful hits or resolve successful saves. So it might be too late. That would be cool, though. What's the coolest play that you've been able to do with the Death Guard, Mandy? Um, It's actually been like several months since I've played with them, so mm-hmm. nothing's like standing out. So no box walkers for sure. We're done with those. And definitely you can play them as a slightly shootier team or play them as a slightly more moving team with a bunch of fighters. And when you get in there, make sure you nuke yourself. (laughs) Yeah. And then the big reason why you like Death Guard and probably why most people who want to play Death Guard are still playing Death Guard is that you get to play with Disgusting Resilient on at all times, right? Absolutely. I think it's one of my favorite rules in all of Kill Team. What was the uh, most damage you've ever avoided? Do you know? Oh, gosh. It had to have been in the 20s. I swear it was crazy. There was dice everywhere. (laughs) Yeah. There's definitely a play out in the World Championships last year where I think Orion's Geller Pox, one of his hulks, managed to fade like 13 out of 16 damage or somewhere in the past 10 past the tens out of like a 16 or 17 damage attack and that basically like swung the game entirely in his favor when he was playing the gallopox mutants wow so maybe you should try picking up the gallopox maybe i know you know that they might be a little bit hard to pick up just because there's a lot to set up but you do get discussing resilient yeah it might be worth a second look for sure and they are very melee heavy yeah, it's, it's pretty much an all-melee team. That happens to have one guy with a flamer attached to his stomach. It might be right up your alley. Yeah, definitely. I'll be taking a look. All right. Well, are there any final things that you want to shout out about your scene? Or, you know, talk us talk to us a little bit about the New England scene before we uh, take it out for the day. Yeah, so I think, like, over here in New England, um, we actually haven't had many other places doing... Uh, organized play. I have um, some regular attendants coming from New Hampshire. Um, even we had somebody recently come from Northern Maine. Um, so there is like a lot of traveling to come visit us um, down in Norton in Mass. Um, just because there isn't like consistent organized play happening. Um, but people have been noticing that we've been posting these monthly tournaments on best coast pairings and they're like, okay, well it's been like four months now and they're still happening. So maybe I'll go swing by, um, which is wicked cool um, to think that we're, we're really growing so much. Um, So we're just really happy that we've been able to foster such a good community, a supportive community uh, who's really welcomed, welcomed a lot of new newcomers and which shop are you running things out of? Just so that for anyone who happens to be listening in that area, they have a chance to, you know, go to the shop. Yes, um, I am the store manager at Battleground Games and Hobbies of Norton. Okay, all right. We'll have uh, links to that in the show notes, I'm sure, right, Jason? Absolutely. Yeah, and feel free to um, hop on our store's Discord as well. We have three locations. We're located in Norton, Mass., Abington, Mass., and in Saugus, Mass. as well. Um, we all three stores share one Discord server, but we have a Kill Team channel in there, so feel free to pop in and say hi to the guys as well. Do you try rotating tournaments between the three shops? We don't know. Norton has become the home base of Kill Team. I see, I see. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Hopefully I can make it up there at some point, because it is. I think it is just a train ride for me. Granted, oh, it's I would not love the to shortest have you. train ride. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to have you. Come on by. I mean, you know, on my part, we'll have the New York Open it coming up really soon. I think it'll literally be the weekend of this podcast release. So if you don't have your tickets, try to get them now. We have uh, Betch and Gretchen doing our painting competition and doing a casual game on November 4th, Saturday night. 
So if anyone who doesn't know and is in the area wants to come, please come to the New York Open. And I think, Jason, yours is the week after, right? Um, it's two weeks after. It's the same as Mandy's tournament. Um, we, we've got the Renegade Open convention, and we've got a Friday night, which is going to be a, a narrative event, Escape the Gallow Dark. Uh, I'm thinking I might bring lights and speakers and, like, overhaul the vibes for the narrative thing. Um, we'll see. And then... Um, on Saturday and Sunday, if we end up breaking 16 players, it's going to be a two-day uh, GT. Nice. Just for, wow. like, the finals, basically? Yeah. Um, right, yeah. Yeah, so Sounds I'm like looking a great forward time. to that. All right. Well, listeners, thanks for hopping on. You know, don't forget to check out Lesser's Workshop, where you can get a Just Another Kill Team podcast gauge. And thank you, Mandy, for coming on. Talk, talk about you. New, or New England.